Welcome to Audiobook Heaven. Section 6, Book the Sixth Argument The gods, having left the field, victory now inclines to the side of the Greeks, and Hellenus counsels Hector to order a public supplication to Minerva in the citadel. While Hector is gone to the city for that purpose, Diomedes and Glaucus recognize the friendship which had formerly existed between their fathers, and exchange armor in token of amity. Hecuba and the Trojan matrons present a robe to Minerva, and offer up prayers for their country. Hector reproves Paris, and brings him back to the field, having first taken an affecting farewell of his wife and child. And now the dreadful battle of the Trojans and the Greeks was abandoned. Often, here and there, the battle raged through the plain, the combatants directing against each other their brass-tipped spears between the rivers of Samoas and Xanthus. First Telamonian Ajax, the bulwark of the Greeks, broke through the phalanx of the Trojans, and gave light to his companions, smiting the good and mighty hero Achimus, son of Isaurus, who was the bravest among the Thracians. First he struck him on the ridge of the horse-haired helmet, and the brazen spear fixed itself in his forehead and passed on within the bone. But darkness veiled his eyes. But Diomede, brave in the din of war, slew Axilus, the son of Teuthrus, who dwelt in well-built Arispa, rich in wealth, and he was beloved by men, for dwelling in a house near the public way, he was wont to afford entertainment to all. But none of them, his guests coming up before him, warded off sad death. But Diomede, deprived both of life, himself and his attendant Calesius, who then was the charioteer of his steeds, and both these entered the earth. And Euryalus slew Dressus and Opheltius, and afterwards went against Asipus and Pedasus, whom formerly the naiad nymph Aberberea brought forth to blameless Bucolion. Bucolion was the son of illustrious Laomedon, eldest by birth, but him his mother brought forth secretly. While Bicolian was a shepherd, he was mingled in love and nuptials with her amongst the sheep. But she, becoming pregnant, brought forth twin sons, and truly the son of Mesistius relaxed their strength and their illustrious limbs, and tore the armor from their shoulders. And next warlike Polypotes slew Astialis. Ulysses killed Percosian Pidites with his brazen spear, and Agamemnon, king of men, slew Elatus. He dwelt at lofty Pedasus, on the banks of fair-flowing Satnioas. The hero Lytus slew Philacus flying, and Eurypylus killed and spoiled Melanthius. In the next place Menelaus, valiant in the din of war, took Adrastus alive, for his two steeds flying bewildered over the plain, coming in violent contact with a branch of Tamarisk, and having broken the curved chariot at the extremity of the pole, themselves flew towards the city, whither others also fled terrified. But he was rolled from his chariot near the wheel, prone in the dust on his mouth. But near him stood Menelaus, the son of Atreus, holding his long-shadowed spear. And Drastus then, embracing his knees, supplicated him, Take me alive, O son of Atreus, and receive a worthy ransom. In my wealthy father's house lie abundant stores, brass and gold, and well-wrought steel out of which my sire will bestow on thee countless ransom gifts, if he shall hear that I am alive at the ships of the Greeks. Thus he spoke, and persuaded his mind in his breast, and already he was on the point of consigning him to the care of his attendant, to conduct him to the ships of the Greeks. But Agamemnon, running up, met him, and shouting in a chiding tone, spoke, O soft one, O Menelaus, why art thou thus so much concerned for these men? In sooth very kind offices were done to thee and thy family by the Trojans, of whom let none escape utter destruction, and our hands, not even him whom the mother carries, being an infant in her womb, let not even him escape. But let all the inhabitants of Ilium perish totally, without burial rites, and obscure. Thus having said, the hero changed his brother's mind, having advised right things. But he, with his hand, thrust back the hero Adrastus from him, and him King Agamemnon smote in the belly, and he was cast supine. But the son of Atreus, planting his heel upon his breast, drew out the ashen spear. 
then nestor exhorted the greeks exclaiming aloud o friends grecian heroes servants of mars let no one now desirous of spoil linger behind that he may return bringing abundance to the ships but let us slay the men and afterwards at your leisure shall ye spoil the dead bodies through the plain thus having said he aroused the might and courage of each and then truly had the trojans retreated into ilium under the influence of the mars beloved greeks conquered through their own cowardice had not helenus son of priam by far the best of augurs standing near spoken these words to aeneas and to hector aeneas and hector since upon you chiefly of the trojans and lydians the labour devolves because ye are the bravest for every purpose both to fight and to take counsel stand here and stay the forces before the gates running in all directions before that on the contrary flying they fall into the arms of their wives and become a triumph to the enemies but after ye have exhorted all the phalanxes we remaining here will fight against the greeks though much pressed for necessity urges us but hector do thou go to the city and then speak to thy mother and mine and let her collecting it together the matrons of distinction into the temple of azure-eyed minerva on the lofty citadel and having opened the doors of the sacred house with the key let her place on the knees of fair-haired minerva the robe which seems to her the most beautiful and the largest in her palace and which is much the most dear to her and let her promise to sacrifice to that goddess in her temple twelve yearling heifers as yet ungoaded if she will take compassion on the city and on the wives and infant children of the trojans if indeed she will avert from sacred ilium the son of tydeus that ferocious warrior the dire contriver of flight whom i declare to be the bravest of the greeks nor have we ever to such a degree dreaded achilles chiefest of men whom they say is from a goddess but this man rages excessively nor can any equal him in might thus he said but hector was by no means disobedient to his brother and instantly from his chariot he leaped to the ground with his arms and brandishing his sharp spears he went in all directions through the army inciting them to fight and he stirred up dreadful battle but they rallied round and stood opposite the greeks but the greeks retreated and desisted from slaughter for they thought that some of the immortals from the starry heaven had descended to aid the trojans in such a way did they rally but hector exhorted the trojans exclaiming aloud courageous trojans and far-summoned allies be men my friends and recall to mind your daring valour whilst i go to ilium and tell to the aged counsellors and to our wives to pray to the gods and to vow them hecatombs thus having spoken crest-tossing hector departed but about him the black hide the border which surrounded his bossy shield kept striking his angles and neck son of hippolochus and the son of tydeus met in the midst of both armies eager to fight but when now they were near going against each other diomede brave in the din of war first addressed him who of mortal men art thou o most brave for never yet have i beheld thee in the glorious fight but now indeed thou hast far surpassed all in thy confidence since thou hast awaited my long-shadowed spear certainly they are the sons of the hapless who meet my strength but if one of the immortals thou art come from heaven i would not fight with the celestial gods for valiant lycurgus the son of dryas did not live long who contended with the heavenly gods he who once pursued the nurses of raving bacchus through sacred nyssa but they all at once cast their sacred implements on the ground smitten by man-slaying lycurgus with an oak's goad but bacchus too terrified sunk under the wave of the sea and thetis received him affrighted in her bosom for dreadful trembling had seized him on account of the threat of the man with him the peaceful living gods were afterwards enraged and the son of saturn rendered him blind nor did he live much longer for he became an object of aversion to all the immortal gods wherefore i should not wish to fight with the blessed gods but if thou art any one of mortals who eat the fruit of the earth come hither that thou mayest speedily reach the goal of death him then the renowned son of hippolochus addressed in turn magnanimous son of tydeus why dost thou inquire of my race as is a race of leaves even such is a race of men some leaves the wind sheds upon the ground but the fructifying wood produces others and these grow up in the season of spring such is a generation of men one produces another ceases to do so 
but if thou wouldst learn even these things that thou mayest well know my lineage for many know it there is a city ephyra in a nook of horse pasturing argos there dwelt sisyphus who was the most cunning of mortals sisyphus son of aeolus and he begat a son glaucus but glaucus begat blameless bellerophon to whom the gods gave beauty and agreeable manliness but against him proetus devised evils in his soul who accordingly banished him from the state since he was far the best of the greeks for jove had subjected them to his sceptre with him the wife of proetus noble antia passionately longed to be united in secret love but by no means could she persuade just-minded wise reflecting bellerophon she therefore telling a falsehood thus addressed king proetus mayest thou be dead o proetus or do thou slay bellephoron who desired to be united in love with me against my will thus she said but rage possessed the king at what he heard he was unwilling indeed to slay him for he scrupled this in his mind but he sent him into lycia and gave to him fatal characters writing many things of deadly purport on a sealed tablet and ordered him to show it to his father-in-law to the end that he might perish he therefore went into lycia under the blameless escort of the gods but when now he had arrived at lycia and at the river xanthus the king of wide lycia honoured him with a willing mind nine days did he entertain him hospitably and sacrificed nine oxen but when the tenth rosy-fingered morn appeared then indeed he interrogated him and desired to see the token whatever it was that he brought from his son-in-law proetus but after he had received the fatal token of his son-in-law first he commanded him to slay the invincible chimera but she was of divine race not of men in front of a lion behind a dragon in the middle a goat breathing forth a dreadful might of gleaming fire and her indeed he slew relying on the signs of the gods next he fought with the illustrious solimi and he said that he entered on this as the fiercest fight among men thirdly he slew the man opposing amazons but for him returning the king wove another wily plot selecting the bravest men from wide lycia he placed an ambuscade but they never returned home again for blameless bellephoron slew them all but when iobates knew that he was the offspring of a god he detained him there and gave him his daughter he also gave him half of all his regal honour the lycians also separated for him an enclosure of land excelling all others pleasant vine-bearing and arable that he might cultivate it but this woman brought forth three children to warlike bellephoron isandrus hippolochus and laodamia provident jove indeed had clandestine intercourse with laodamia and she brought forth godlike brazen-helmed sarpedon but when now even he bellephoron was become odious to all the gods he on his part wandered alone through the Elean plain pining in his soul and shunning the path of men but mars insatiable of war slew his son isandrus fighting against the illustrious solimi and golden-reigned diana being enraged slew his daughter but hippolochus begat me and from him i say that i am born me he sent to troy and gave me very many commands always to fight bravely and to be superior to others and not to disgrace the race of my fathers who were by far the bravest in ephyra and ample lycia from this race and blood do i boast to be thus he said and diomede valiant in the din of war rejoiced his spear indeed he fixed in the all-nurturing earth and next addressed the shepherd of the people in courteous words certainly thou art my father's ancient guest for in his halls noble oeneus once entertained blameless bellephoron having detained him for twenty days and they bestowed valuable gifts of hospitality on each other oeneus on his part gave a belt shining with purple and bellephoron in turn a golden double cup and this i left in my halls when i was coming hither but tydeus i remember not for he left me whilst i was yet young when the people of the greeks perished at thebes wherefore i am a guest friend to thee in the midst of argos and thou art the same to me in lycia whenever i shall visit their state but let us also in the crowd avoid even each other's spears for there are many trojans and illustrious allies for me to slay whomsoever the deity shall present and i shall overtake with my feet and there are many greeks in turn for thee to slay whomsoever thou canst but let us exchange arms with each other 
that even these may know that we profess to be friends by our ancestors thus having spoken leaping down from their steeds they took each other's hand and plighted faith then saturnian jove took away prudence from glaucus who exchanged armour with iomede the son of tydeus giving golden arms for brazen the value of a hundred beeves for the value of nine but when hector arrived at the scaean gates and the beech tree around him ran the trojan wives and daughters inquiring for their sons their brothers their friends and husbands but he then ordered all in order to supplicate the gods for evils were impending over many but when now he had arrived at the very beautiful dwelling of priam built with well-polished porticoes but in it were fifty chambers of polished marble built near one another where lay the sons of priam with their lawful wives and opposite on the other side within the hall were the twelve roofed chambers of his daughters of polished marble built near to one another where the sons-in-law of priam slept with their chaste wives there his fond mother met him as she was going to laodice the most excellent in form of her daughters and she hung upon his hand and addressed him and spoke my son why hast thou come having left the bold fight certainly the abominable sons of the greeks harass thee much fighting around thy city thy mind hath urged thee to come hither to uplift thy hands to jove from the lofty citadel but wait till i bring thee genial wine that first thou may makest a libation to jove and to the other immortal gods and then thou shalt refresh thyself if thou wilt drink for to a wearied man wine greatly increases strength since thou art wearied aiding thy kinsmen but her mighty crest tossing hector then answered bring me not genial wine venerable mother lest thou enervate me and i forget my might and valour but i dread to pour out dark red wine to jove with unwashed hands nor is it by any means lawful for me denied with blood and gore to offer vows to the cloud-compelling son of saturn but go thou to the temple of minerva the pillager with victims having assembled the matrons of distinction and the robe which is the most beautiful and the largest in the palace and by far the most esteemed by thyself that place on the knees of the fair-haired goddess and vow that thou wilt sacrifice to her in her temple twelve heifers yearlings ungoaded if she will take compassion on the city and the wives and infant children of the trojans if she will avert from sacred ilium the son of tydeus that fierce warrior the valiant author of terror do thou on thy part go to the temple of the pillager minerva but i will go after paris that i may call him if he is willing to hear me speaking would that the earth might there open for him for him hath olympian jove reared as a great bane to the trojans to magnanimous priam and to his sons could i but behold him descending to hades i might say that my soul had forgotten its joyless woe thus he spoke but she going to her palace gave orders to her maids and they assembled through the city the matrons of distinction but she descended into her fragrant chamber where were her variously embroidered robes the works of sidonian females which godlike alexander himself had brought from sidon sailing over the broad ocean in that voyage in which he carried off helen sprung from a noble sire hecuba taking one of these which was most beauteous with various hues and largest brought it as a gift to minerva and it glittered like a star and lay the undermost of all but she hastened to set out and many venerable matrons hurried along with her but when they had arrived at the temple of minerva in the lofty citadel fair-cheeked theano the daughter of Cisseus, wife of horse-breaking antinor opened to them the gates for the trojans had made her priestess of minerva they all with a loud wailing upraised their hands to minerva but fair-cheeked theano having received the garment placed it on the knees of fair-haired minerva and making vows thus prayed to the daughter of mighty jove venerable minerva guardian of the city divine one of goddesses break now the spear of diomede and grant that he may fall prostrate before the scaean gates that we may forthwith sacrifice to thee in thy temple twelve yearlings untamed heifers if thou wilt pity the city and the wives of the trojans and their infant children so she spake in prayer but pallas minerva refused thus they on their part offered vows to the daughter of mighty jove but hector had gone to the beautiful halls of alexander which he himself had built with the aid of men who then were the most skilful artificers in fruitful troy who made for him a chamber a dwelling-room 
and hall in the lofty citadel near the palaces of priam and hector there jove beloved hector entered and in his hand he held a spear of eleven cubits the brazen point of the spear shone in front and a golden ring encircled it but him he found in his chamber preparing his very beauteous armor his shield and corslet and fitting his curved bow argive helen sat amongst her female servants and assigned their tasks to her maids of renowned work but hector seeing reproached him with foul words infatuate not not befittingly hast thou conceived this rage in thy mind the people are perishing fighting around the city and lofty wall and on thy account the battle and war are blazing around the city truly thou wouldst thyself reprove another if ever thou sawest any person remiss in the hateful battle but arise lest perchance the city should quickly blaze with hostile fire but him godlike alexander then addressed hector since thou hast with reason reproved me and not without reason therefore will i tell thee but do thou attend and hear me i was sitting in my chamber neither so much from anger nor indignation against the trojans but because i wished to give way to grief but now my wife advising me with soothing words hath urged me to go to the battle and to myself also it seems to be better for victory alternates to men but come now wait let me put on my martial arms or go on and i will follow and i think that i shall overtake thee thus he said but crest tossing hector did not answer him but helen addressed hector with soothing words brother-in-law of me shameless authoress of mischief devising fearful wretch would that on the day when first my mother brought me forth a destructive tempest of wind had seized and borne me to a mountain or into the waves of the much resounding ocean where the billow would have swept me away before these doings had occurred but since the gods have thus decreed these evils i ought at least to have been the wife of a braver man who understood both the indignation and the many reproaches of men but this man's sentiments are neither conscious now nor will they be hereafter wherefore i think he will reap the fruits of them but come now enter and sit on this seat brother-in-law since toils have greatly encompassed thy mind on account of shameless me and of the guilt of alexander on whom jove hath imposed an unhappy lot that even in time to come we should be a subject of song to future men but her mighty crest tossing hector then answered do not bid me sit helen though courteous for thou wilt not persuade me for now was my mind urged on that i may aid the trojans who have great regret for me absent but do thou arouse paris and let him hasten that he may overtake me being within the city for i will go home that i may see my domestics my beloved wife and my infant son for i know not whether i shall ever again return to them or whether the gods will now subdue me under the hands of the greeks thus having said crest tossing hector departed and immediately he then arrived at his well-situated palace nor did he find white-armed andromache in the halls but she stood lamenting and weeping on the tower with her son and her well-robed maid but hector when he found not his blameless wife within went and stood at the threshold and said to the female servants i pray you maids tell me truly whither went white-armed andromache from the palace has she gone anywhere to the dwellings of her husband's sisters or to those of any of her well-robed brother-in-law's wives or to the temple of minerva where the other fair-haired trojan matrons are appeasing the dreadful goddess him then the active housewife in turn answered hector since thou biddest me to tell the truth she has not gone to any of her husband's sisters nor to any of her well-robed brother-in-law's wives nor to the temple of minerva where the other fair-haired trojan matrons are appeasing the dreadful goddess but she went to the lofty tower of ilium when she heard that the trojans were worn out and that the valour of the greeks was great she is now on her way hastening to the wall like unto one frenzied and the nurse along with her bears the child thus spoke the housewife but hector hastened away from the palace back the same way through the well-built streets when he had arrived at the scaean gates after passing through the great city for by this he was about to pass out on to the plain there met him his richly dowered spouse running andromache daughter of the magnanimous Aetion, Aetion, who dwelt in woody hypoplacus in hypoplacian thebes reigning over cilician men his daughter was then possessed by brazen-helmed hector she then met him 
and with her came a maid carrying in her bosom the tender child an infant quite the only son of hector like unto a beauteous star him hector had named scamandrius but others as the annex for hector alone protected ilium he indeed gazing in silence upon his son smiled but andromache stood near him weeping and she hung upon his hand and addressed him and spoke strange man this thy valour will destroy thee nor dost thou pity thy infant child and unhappy me who very soon will be bereft of thee for presently the greeks will slay thee all attacking thee at once for me much better it were to sink into the earth when bereft of thee for there will no longer be any other comfort for me when thou shalt draw on thy destruction but sorrows only nor have i father or venerable mother for divine achilles slew my father and laid waste the well-inhabited city of the cilicians lofty-gated thebes he slew etion but spoiled him not he scrupled in his mind to do that but he burned him together with his well-wrought arms and heaped a tomb over him and around him the mountain nymphs daughters of ages bearing jove planted elms moreover the seven brothers besides whom i had at home all these departed to hades in one day for divine swift-footed achilles slew them all amidst their crooked hooved oxen and their snowy sheep and my mother who ruled in woody hippoplacus after that he had led her hither with other treasures he sent back at liberty having received countless ransom gifts but her the shaft rejoicing diana slew in my father's hall but o hector to me thou art both father and venerable mother and brother thou art also my blooming consort but come now pity me and abide here in the tower nor make thy child an orphan and thy wife a widow and place a company at the wild fig tree where the city is chiefly easy of ascent and the wall can be scaled for going to this very quarter the bravest of the greeks have thrice assaulted and the two ajaces and most renowned idomeneus and the sons of atreus and the brave son of tydeus certainly some person well skilled in prophecy mentioned it to them or their own mind impels and orders them but her then in turn the mighty crest-tossing hector addressed assuredly to me also are all these things a subject of anxiety dear wife but i am exceedingly ashamed of the trojans and the long-robed trojan dames if i like a dastard keeping aloof should avoid the battle nor does my mind incline me thus for i have learned to be always brave and to fight in the foremost among the trojans seeking to gain both my father's great glory and mine own for well i know this in my mind and soul a day will arrive when sacred ilium shall perish and priam and the people of priam skilled in the ashen spear but to me the grief that is to come will not be so great on account of the trojans neither for hecuba herself nor for king priam nor for my brothers who many and excellent are destined to fall in the dust beneath hostile men as for thee when some one of the brazen-mailed greeks shall lead thee away weeping having deprived thee of the day of freedom and perchance being in argos thou mayest weave the web at the command of some other dame and bear water from the fountain of messias or hyperia very unwillingly and hard necessity will oppress thee whilst some one hereafter beholding thee pouring forth tears will say this was the wife of hector who was the bravest in battle of the horse-breaking trojans when they fought round ilium thus will some one hereafter say but fresh anguish will be thine from the want of such a husband to avert the day of servitude but may the heaped earth cover me dead before i hear of this lamentation and abduction thus having said illustrious hector stretched out his arms for his son but the child screaming shrunk back to the bosom of the well-zoned nurse affrighted at the aspect of his dear sire fearing the brass and the horse-haired crest seeing it nodding dreadfully from the top of the helmet gently his loving father smiled and his revered mother instantly illustrious hector took the helmet from his head and laid it all glittering on the ground and having kissed his beloved child and fondled him in his hands thus spoke praying to jove and to the other gods jove and ye other gods grant that this my son also may become even as i am distinguished amongst the trojans so powerful in might and bravely to rule over ilium and may some one hereafter say concerning him returning from the fight he indeed is much braver than his sire 
and let him bear away the bloody spoils having slain the foe and let his mother rejoice in her soul thus having said he placed the boy in the hands of his beloved spouse but she smiling tearfully received him in her fragrant bosom her husband regarding her pitied her and soothed her with his hand and addressed her and said beloved be not at all too sad in thine heart on my account for no man shall send me prematurely to the shades but i think there is no one of men who has escaped fate neither the coward nor the brave man after he has once been born but do thou going home take care of thy own works thy web and distaff and command thy maids to perform their task but war shall be a care to all the men who are born in ilium and particularly to me thus having spoken illustrious hector took up the horse-haired helmet and his beloved wife departed home looking back from time to time and shedding copious tears then immediately she reached the very commodious palace of the man-slaying hector and within she found many maids and in all of them she excited grief they indeed bewailed in his own palace hector still alive for they thought that he would never return back again from battle escaping the might and the hands of the greeks nor did paris delay in his lofty halls but he after he had put on his famous arms variegated with brass then hastened through the city relying on his swift feet and as when a stabled courser fed with barley at the stall having broken his cord runs prancing over the plain elate with joy being accustomed to bathe in some fair flowing river he bears aloft his head and his mane is tossed about on his shoulders but he relying on his beauty his knees easily bear him to the accustomed pastures of the mares thus paris the son of priam shining in arms like the sun exulting descended down from the citadel of pergamus but his swift feet bore him and immediately after he found his noble brother hector when he was now about to depart from the palace where he was conversing with his spouse him godlike alexander first addressed honoured brother assuredly now i am altogether detaining thee although hastening nor have i come in due time as thou didst order him then crest-tossing hector answering addressed strange man not any man indeed who is just could dispraise thy deeds of war for thou art brave but willingly art thou remiss and dost not wish to fight and my heart is saddened in my breast when i hear of dishonourable things of thee from the trojans who have much toil on thy account but let us away these things we shall arrange hereafter if ever jove shall grant us to place a free goblet in our halls to the heavenly everlasting gods when we shall have repulsed the well-grieved greeks from troy End of book the sixth read by stephen carney